the 50 states to Washington. From the elected representative to the federal czar, from the citizen to the state, we know exactly what lies in store for you. I've been a member of the European Parliament for 12 years. I am living in your future, or at least the future towards which your present leaders seem intent on taking you. And believe me, my friends, you are not going to enjoy it. Oh, that was Daniel Hannon's warning to America at CPAC back in the beginning of February, and that is the last time we caught up with our next guest, Daniel Hannon, member of European Parliament uh, and a Conservative. Pleasure to see you what? again, sir. A pleasure to see you, Brian. I want to ask you about um, y your warning to America. Now you're in Ottawa. Do you have a warning for Canada about this idea of expanding government even more? We we've got a... Um, a conservative senator wrote a book a little while ago, mm. and part of his argument was, we need a North American parliament. Right, because that that's what people are demanding, me. another tier of salaried politicians. I'm sure that is at the top of most voters' uh, set of demands. I mean, you know, the, it's, a, it's a basic rule that the further government gets from people, the bigger it gets, and the, the more unresponsive it gets, and the more expensive it gets, because the... the Politicians can concentrate on making themselves comfortable instead of having to do what the rest of us uh, would like them to do. And, you know, as someone who's working in such a system, I can tell you that from first-hand experience. All the evidence suggests that we should go in the opposite direction, that countries become richer and happier and freer when power is devolved. I mean, you know, I, I, I guess that if I were a Canadian politician, I would be lobbying very hard for a devolution of power from... Ottawa to the provinces and from provincial governments to, to local councils. Um, the one bit of advice I would give from a European perspective is keep decisions as close as possible to the people that they affect. And yet we hear this argument and we've heard it for a long time since Trudeau in this country. We need a strong central government because we're big and therefore, you know, we've got, we can't have patchwork mm. quilt of programs. I mean, we've got to have a national standard. It would be horrible if someone in Calgary did anything different right. than someone in Newfoundland. And have you noticed that that always ends up working in the left's advantage, right? If you have harmonized taxes, do they ever get harmonized downwards? You know, if you have harmonized rules on social security, employment law and so on, is that ever done in a free market direction? Of course not. And the reason is competition, jurisdictional competition, is the main constraint on big government. You know, you can push your taxes up to a certain level and then the money starts to flee to friendlier tax jurisdictions. Or you can give very generous rules on maternity leave, paternity leave, up to a certain point, then the jobs start going abroad. The, the more you harmonize those things, the more you standardize, the more you get out of having to make the tough decisions that will make you more competitive because you're basically just exporting your costs to your rivals. And that is what has served to make the European Union a smaller and you know, shriveled, uh, reduced part of the world economy at a time when the bits of the world that have learnt the secret of devolution, the great Asian economies, are going in the opposite direction. You are front and centre for watching the uh, insanity of this Europe. You've bailed yeah. out Greece how many times now? Oh, I mean, I, you know, I lose count, but it's important to get this right. We're not bailing out Greece. Uh, we're not bailing out the people of Greece. We are bailing out the bankers and bondholders who made some stupid investment decisions. And I, I have some sympathy with the guys in Greece complaining, you know, protesting in St. Agnes Square, because they, they know perfectly well that they're not going to get the money. The money is going to rescue some very rich people, but they're going to be stuck with the bill for the repayment. And, you know, so it, one way of looking at this Greek bailout is that it's yet another bank bailout, only whereas it would have been much, much cheaper just to give the money directly to the banks, we've, we've decided to circulate it scenically through Athens, which is just crazy. And, and of course, governments always take their, their cut, bureaucrats get their cut, and the money Every goes. tube and chamber of that machine is leaky. Right, uh, the, the, the money dribbles away. You know, why the Greek default happened yesterday, and it was much bigger than it would have been if it had happened right at the beginning, when we first saw that it was inevitable three years ago. Why did they defer it for three years and allow the, 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 the sum of debt to keep growing? Because if it had happened three years ago, the hit would have been taken overwhelmingly by foreign banks. By putting it off for three years, they allowed those banks to shuffle off their debt onto the IMF, the EU, the various government-to-government -government bilateral loans. In other words, yet again, A the taxpayer bailout. has stepped in to rescue some very wealthy individuals. The poor are bailing out the rich. I want to ask you quickly about Stephen Harper. Your view of Stephen Harper from 
a distance. We look at him, we complain that he spends too much. Your thoughts? Because you're too close. I mean, you know, I felt the same way about Margaret Thatcher when she was Prime Minister. You know, no man is a, a hero to his valet. When you're, when you're standing right next to the movie star, you see that the makeup has been caked on and that, you know, it, that there are imperfections. Um, I can now see with the perspective of time about Margaret Thatcher what I think I can see with the perspective of distance about Stephen Harper, which is this, you know, he is a statesman. He is a statesman of the first rank who has restored pride and prosperity to a country. You know, of all the major economies in the world, Canada is the one that has come through the crash in good shape without this massive debt crisis, without the, 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 the bank failures. That didn't happen by accident. Right? There was a reason for that. Um, and you know, I, I'm absolutely delighted that he earned his, his majority. I, I remember when he made his first speech in London as a minority prime minister, talking about the common law and parliamentary basis of Canada's heritage and uh, how that had been you know, the, the basis of Canada's freedom. Uh, uncontroversial in a way, but what a change from what all the Trudeau era people had said that this country was a happy multi culty fusion of illegal immigrants and first peoples and friends. You know. And I remember thinking then, you know, great, Canada's back. How wonderful. Instead of being an outpost of, of continental Europe in North America, they've rejoined the Anglosphere. And, you know, I would, what, whatever imperfections, I suppose it's the job of these movement conservatives to focus on the imperfections and try and correct them, but, you know, I would gladly swap our politicians for him. All right. Daniel Hannan, thanks for joining us. I hope you'll join us again from London next time. With pleasure. All right. It's great hearing from you.